speaker today. Uh, Dr. Serge Bordani is professor of FSC, uh, APFL, Swiss Federal Institute of Technologies, where he has uh, uh, security and cryptography technology. As you know, Serge has been really active in this field. He has written many papers and books and edited proceedings as program chairs of ISR conferences and workshops, including FSC 95, uh, 98, uh, PKC 2005, Europe 2006, and so on. As today's invited talk, uh, FSC program committee asked uh, Serge to give a talk on RFIDs. Today's talk is about distance bounding. This is a gross topic involving, involving construction based on symmetric cryptography. So the title of this talk is uh, Towards Secure Distance Bounding. Kind of introduction. I would like to thank the program committee for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I will present you some joint work with uh, Ioana Burialu and uh, Katerina Mitrokotsa. It's about distance bonding. So distance bonding is one way to prove that uh, someone is close to someone else. So for example, I can prove that I'm close to you. So maybe here you, would, you, you, you may be looking at someone who, who looks like talking, but maybe you're looking at a robot, and I may be sitting somewhere far away in Switzerland trying to uh, uh, pilot this robot. So if this ID is uncomfortable for you, uh, I can try to prove you that I'm really close to you. So that's one way, one application of distance bonding. So maybe an interesting application. So I just arrived from Switzerland, so I may uh, I may be saying some stupidities. So please uh, forgive me for any uh, inconsistency with it. So uh, I will uh, first introduce uh, the notion of distance bounding. Then I will essentially show that there exists no secure distance bounding in the literature so far, and uh, try to, to propose a new protocol which is hopefully secure. So first, why distance bonding? So there is a, a very uh, a popular uh, way uh, to try to, to win at chess. So if you, don't, if you don't master chess very well, if you're not a, a very good chess player, you can try to defeat a grandmaster uh, chess in, in some very easy way. So here you have some guy who tries to defeat two grandmaster chess. So there is one grandmaster chess uh, one chess grandmaster here who is deeply thinking uh, at what he wants to move, another chess grandmaster here, and this guy is defeating both of them, but, uh, but the two uh, masters do not know about this fact. So here this guy will, be, will make a move, so he's playing the black, he will make a move, and then this guy will run very fast to the other board to do exactly the same move. So he's playing the black against the other, and he waits for the other to make a move, so that he will go back and play the same move to, again the first uh, the first master so with this strategy this guy does, is not a very good player at the chess but he can defeat the two grandmasters here and he's making sure that actually both of them will spend a hard time uh, playing against him so the same they play against this guy but actually they're playing against uh, each other so that's actually a relay attack so a real attack, you have here a prover and a verifier, and someone in the middle <laughs> is playing against both of them uh, at the same time. So here this, this guy is saying, sending a message, so he, he explains the verifier side of the protocol, but he's relaying the message to uh, a simulator of a prover here who, who, who sends a message to the verifier, and he waits for the answer to forward it back for him. So that's a real attack. So where can we have relay attacks? You can find many applications of relay attacks. So this is an example. Here you have uh, one uh, fancy car, which can be opened, which can be uh, controlled by a, a wireless key. 
So the, for some cars, you have some this kind of wireless key who can open and close the car and even start the engine. And sometimes you don't even have to press a button to do that. So it means that someone who is sitting close to the uh, to the key holder can just relay uh, whatever he intercepts from the key to someone who is very close to the car uh, and so on, so that the car will open. So some people have demonstrated that this attack is feasible against many, many cars. So that's uh, uh, actually a real threat uh, uh, for, for this uh, application for, for wireless cars. Another application here, you have a, uh, an EPFL fellow called Roger here, who tries to access to the building of EPFL uh, during, uh, during night or during the weekend. So during night or during the weekend, the doors are op not open, but you can uh, just present this kind of card to the entrance door, and the, the door will open. So here you have some contactless uh, uh, protocol between this card, which has an RFID inside, and this RFID reader, so that the door will control uh, access and eventually open. So of course, you can relay uh, the messages from the card to the door. So if you're here, um, so for instance, here I have my EPFL uh, card, so you can just be close to my, uh, to my pocket and just relay the messages to someone who is uh, at EPFL to try to open the door of EPFL. So that's a real attack, just to open the doors. Another application is for payment system. Here you have one payment system, which is completely wireless, with some wireless card on this device. But you can also think of uh, traditional payment system with a credit card. So if you try to, to buy something in a shop, you, you will use your card and you will try to pay on a device, but maybe this device is malicious. So maybe this device is just relaying the messages to someone who is, well, who is a fake card, is trying to buy something which is more expensive. And you have no clue to protect against this, except by seeing that this, this terminal is malicious. So that's a real attack, and it's also a threat. So some people have demonstrated that this, this is a feasible attack. And to avoid that, we need to prove that the card is close to the uh, terminal making, uh, uh, registering the payment. OK, so for that, Bronson shown proposed a long time ago the notion of uh, distance bounding protocol. In the distance bounding protocol, you have a prover and a verifier so I won't go through this protocol here because uh, you see that there is a public key and we are at FSC. We have a signature, so that's not a, a good protocol to illustrate that. So, but uh, later we'll see some other protocols which are fully symmetric, which use symmetric keys and, and nothing about public keys. So what you can see here is that in these protocols there is a critical phase in which the, the verifier is sending a challenge to the prover, and the prover has to respond. And this phase is time critical. So here, the, this uh, verifier is sending a challenge, and at the same time, it starts the clock. And when the, the response arrives, it starts the clock and, and see if the response arrives fast enough. If the response is uh, arrived very quickly, it means that the prover is close enough. So he, he changed the correctness of the response, and that the response arrived uh, very quickly. So the challenge and responses are consist of a single bit. So here, the challenge is a bit, and the response is one bit as well. So you don't have so much computation to do. So you can expect that the prover will respond immediately, and you will just have to measure the time. So it will measure the time of flight of the challenge and the response. Now, uh, you rely on the fact that uh, information uh, have a speed limit when, uh, when uh, you transmit information. The speed limit is the speed of light. But the light goes pretty fast. So you have to be very quick when you do the measurement. So if you make an error of one microsecond, so during one microsecond, uh, the uh, information can uh, move by 300 meters. So if you have an imprecision of one microsecond, then when, when you translate it in terms of distance, you have an imprecision of 300 meters. So you don't have any time to waste. You, you don't have one microsecond here to do the computation. You have to respond immediately. 
is less than y microsecond. Okay? So that's uh, the principle of distance bounding. So now, more formally, a distance bounding protocol, that's an interactive proof. So it's an interactive proof of proximity. You have a verifier, so we, have, we assume that this verifier is honest. You have a prover, sometimes the prover may be malicious if it tries to, 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 to show that it's close to the verifier, but actually it's far away, so it may be malicious. There, may be a, there, there is a secret to characterize the prover, uh, and on the verifier side, there will be a key corresponding to, to this prover as well. But since we are at FEC, we will assume that these keys are symmetric. So it means that the prover has a secret, and the verifier knows this secret. We will control that the prover knows the secret as well. We will assume concurrency between many participants. So we may have many provers, many verifiers, and concurrence between them. We may have also malicious participants, of course. And what do we expect from an interactive proof? We expect completeness. We expect that if a honest prover is close to the verifier and running the protocols and the verifier will accept. We assume some notion of soundness, so it means that here if the verifier accepts, then there must be one participant close to the verifier who knows the corresponding secret. And some kind of security here, uh, which says that if you honestly run the protocol, then the secret doesn't leak. So it's maybe something which is weaker than the notion of zero knowledge. You don't need zero knowledge. So that's the notion we, you need for identification. You need not to leak any information which can be used to identify the problem. That's what you expect. Now, uh, in the literature, people identify several kinds of threats. So one, the first kind of threat they imagine is the notion of distance fraud. In the case of distance fraud, you have a malicious prover, p -star, who is interacting with the verifier. The p -star is far away from the verifier, but it tries to cheat with the protocol and convince that he's close enough. So when it's based on the measurement of the time of response, it means that the prover has to send the responses before he receives the challenge. So he has to anticipate the challenge and response before he received the challenge. Another possible threat is the, what uh, uh, the SMED calls the mafia fraud. So in that case, you have a honest prover who is far away from the verifier. And someone in the middle who tries to, uh, to convince the verifier that the prover is closed. So if you think of a real attack, that's one example of a mafia fraud, a real attack here. You have an adversary in the middle who is relaying messages from the prover to the verifier. Since the prover is far away, it cannot work. So now we can also consider an adversary who is not only relaying messages, but also uh, manipulating the messages, trying to, to answer by himself and so on. So we may have more general attacks uh, uh, of someone who is uh, in the middle. So that's another uh, popular threat against distance fraud. Another more technical threat is the notion of terrorist fraud. In a terrorist fraud, you have a malicious prover who is far away, and he has a friend here, and he will use his friend, his friend, so his friend is malicious, and he will use his friend to convince the verifier that he's close, close enough. So now, if this, his friend is close to the verifier. One trivial way consists of giving him his key and letting him run the protocol. But since they are malicious, also they are friends, they don't trust each other. So uh, here we consider an adverse, uh, a malicious prover who tries to get the help of a friend to pass the protocol, but without giving him any credentials so that he will, this, his friend will be able to impersonate the prover. So he tries to uh, help this adversary to pass the protocol, but without giving the key. Now, uh, you can also consider impersonation fraud. So that's the case of an adversary who tries to convince that the prover is supposed to verify a pursuit is not the prover. He doesn't hold the secret. And that sometimes there are even more exotic attacks, such as the notion of distance hijacking. So distance hijacking was proposed by Kremer, Rasmussen, Schmidt, and Chapkun. You have a malicious prover 
is far away from the verifier, but you have some other provers who are close to the verifier, they hold some other secret, and this guy is trying to interfere with the communication between this honest prover and the verifier, so that the verifier would be convinced that this guy is actually close to the verifier. So for some protocol, this kind of attack is feasible, and it's called distance hijacking. So this prover is hijacking the distance between this honest prover and the verifier. Okay, so these are the popular threats that we can find in literature. So uh, in uh, our work, we, we try to consider essentially three threat models. The notion of distance fraud, but in the notion of distance fraud, we introduce concurrency. So normally in distance fraud, you just have a malicious prover and a verifier. But here we introduce also other participants. So we tolerate concurrency. So if we tolerate concurrency, then this notion also capture the notion of distance hijacking. So we can factor two threat models in, in, into one. We also take the notion of man-in-the-middle attack. So that's uh, uh, an attack in which you have two phases, a learning phase and an attack phase. In the learning phase, you have an adversary, provers, verifier, and they all interact with each other uh, without any restriction. Then, in this phase, the adversary is trying to learn some information about the keys, essentially. And during the attack phase, you have a prover who is far away from the verifier, and the adversary who has learned something during the learning phase, who tries to convince the verifier that the prover is closed, so it's not the case. So with this notion, so this is something which is a bit more general than the mafia fraud, because in mafia fraud there is no learning phase. But if you uh, ha ad adopt this, this model, it also captures the notion of impersonation fraud. We, we have seen, so it's a, it's a bit more general. It captures some other notion as well. And finally, we also consider pollution fraud, which is very similar to terrorist fraud, maybe a bit more general. We, we say that if uh, uh, a prover who is far from uh, the verifier and interact with uh, an adversary, Make the verifier accepts, then the view of the adversary will give a clue so that this adversary can run a man in the middle attack. Okay? So now we, we try to extract some information to run a man in the middle attack, not only to authenticate, to impersonate, but to run a more general man in the middle attack. That's pollution. So this is what we want to do, and we will consider the security of protocols against these threats. So now if you, if you look at the literature, you have many protocols existing. So this is a short list of protocols which are available in the literature. You have also many attacks existing. So if you look at the literature, you look at the probability of success of these attacks. And you can see that for many protocols, uh, you have, so for example, the plan and show doesn't resist to collision fraud. So actually, it was not made to resist to this collision fraud. You can see that collision fraud are feasible. The Bussard Bagar protocol uh, has actually a distance fraud. It's visible to the distance fraud. And you see that in all the protocols, there, 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 there is at least one attack, except maybe this Swiss knife protocol and this other protocol, TDB. Now, these results do not include some uh, new, more recent attacks that we will uh, discuss uh, in this uh, presentation. So we'll see that actually, all these protocols are vulnerable. Okay? So that's it about uh, the introduction to distance uh, bounding. So now we'll see the difficulty to make these protocols secure. So we start with a very simple protocol, which is a protocol proposed by Henke and Kuhn in 2005. So you can see that you have a prover and the verifier, so they share a secret X. So the prover will convince the verifier that he knows this secret, and that he is close to the verifier. So the distance between the verifier and the prover is small enough. So it starts with some initialization, they exchange some nonces, and with these nonces, they derive two vectors. So with this secret key, they use a pseudo and a function here, and they derive from the nonces two vectors, A1 and A2. Then you have the distance bounding phase, which is time, time critical. So you have n rounds, and for each round, 
So the verifier selects one bit for the challenge. So the challenge is either one or two. So it's, it sends the corresponding bit as a challenge to the prover. And the, if the challenge is one, the prover responds with one bit of A1. If the challenge is two, he responds with one bit of A2. So he responds with a correct co corresponding bit. And the verifier will verify that this bit is correct and that the response arrive uh, 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 quickly enough. So if it goes for all the iterations, then the verifier is happy and he says that, okay, so this uh, authentication is accepted. So now this uh, protocol is vulnerable against a terrorist fraud. Actually, it was not meant to resist. So it's not a big discovery. So, Let's just see how this terrorist fraud works. So in this terrorist fraud, you have the Spanish scooper here, who knows the secret. You have the adversary, who is a friend of this Spanish scooper. And during the initialization phase, they have plenty of text, so they can just relay messages. So they exchange the nonsense. And at the end of uh, this initialization, the prover can just leave the two vectors, A1 and A2, to the adversary. Now, with this vector A1 and A2, the adversary can run the time critical phase. It can directly answer to the verifier. But these two vectors, A1 and A2, do not give him any advantage. So, A1 and A2 will not help the adversary to later impersonate the prover. So, that's a terrorist fault. Okay? So, if we want to protect against this kind of attack, we have to change the protocol. Now, one way to do that is to use the protocol by, uh, by this person that we call uh, DBN. Here in this protocol, you still have two vectors, but only the first one is derived from the nonsense, and the second one is just the vector A1 solved with a secret. So if you do that, you cannot uh, use the previous time because if you reveal A1 and A2, it means that you reveal X because the XOR between A1 and A2 is X. So here the malicious prover can no longer reveal A1 and A2 without compromising his secret. So this attack is no longer visible. But now with this uh, protocol, you have some other problems. Actually, you can do uh, a man-in-the-middle attack against this protocol. So how does it work? So that's a man in the middle of the stack against DB Inc., which was proposed by Kim Abwan Kerry Standard in 2008, in which first you have, so that this is a honest prover, this is a honest verifier, and you have another three just relate messages between the prover and the verifier. So that's the learning phase, so you assume that the prover is close to the verifier. So the prover and the verifier are close to each other, but there is a man in the middle who is relaying the nonsense. And at the end, it will relay the challenges and responses, except for one, for one which is the, at the round J. So he selected J, and for this round J, he decides to flip the challenge. So he said, in, instead of forwarding C, CI star, he forwards the complement of CI star. So what happens? Uh, and for the response, he will just respond at random to this challenge. So what happens is that from the prover, he learns uh, the response to the complemented challenge. And then from the verifier, he will deduce the answer to this CJ star. Because if the verifier is happy about the protocol, it means that his response was correct. And if he's not happy, it, it, may, it means that his answer was not correct. In any case, he will deduce what is the correct answer? Because the, the answer is just a bit. So he, he will deduce the answer to CJ star and the complement of CJ star. So it means that he will learn one bit of A1 and the corresponding bit of A2. But since you have this relation here, it means that you will learn one bit of X. So if you learn one bit of X, you learn some information about X. So you can iterate this attack, and you will get the vector x completely. So you can do this man-in-the-middle attack and get the secret. 
And with this secret, you can impersonate the prover, so that's the one in the middle. Okay, so now we have a problem with this scheme because this scheme essentially leaks x. So the idea of the attack is that now you have two vectors, and if you play a man in the middle, you can get one piece of information from the prover and the other piece of information from the verifier. So you can get two answers corresponding to this bit. So one way to avoid that is instead of having two vectors, to use three vectors. Uh, okay. three vectors which, which are here. So now you go back, so that's an idea which is used to Agwan, Lohadou, and Martin, published uh, in 2011. So now you derive again two vectors uh, from the nonces, and now for the challenge you have three possibilities, because you will have three vectors. First vector is A1, second vector is A2, and the third vector will be the sum between a1, a2, and x. So you follow this scheme, and the idea is essentially to use a secret sharing. So you use secret sharing to share the secret x, but you need two, sh uh, two shares are not enough to reconstruct x, you need the three shares to reconstruct x. So with the prover, we get one share, with the verifier, we get another share, share but that's not enough to reconstruct x. So that's the idea of uh, this protocol uh, to, to use a secret share. Now what I forgot to say is that uh, in this uh, protocol uh, uh, by Ed et al, uh, we use, so this is some kind of encryption based on one time pad, but there was a proposal to use some other encryption scheme other than that, but these other solutions are also insecure. So if you use, for instance, the addition modulo some number, or the addition with a random multiplicative factor, then you can also break the scheme with a more clever uh, man in the middle tag. This is what we proposed uh, actually in December at uh, the Inscript conference. Okay, so now we, we, go, we go back to this protocol, TDB. So now we fix the problem of this man in the middle attack. But as we will see, there are still some other problems. So the problem comes with the usage of this function. Actually, the problem was present in all the previous protocols as well. So here, what we use for the function is a pseudo-random function. So in many papers about distance bounding, people use pseudo-random function. And they say, see, it's pseudo-random. It's a pseudo-random function. Actually, if we can break the protocol with this to the function, we can also break uh, the protocol when we replace this function by a really random function. So that's a security argument, which is very familiar uh, for people who manipulate the random function. If you can break the, the protocol with this PRF, you can also break uh, the protocol if you replace the PRF by a random function. So this is what many people do. So if the adversary can break the scheme with the PRF, then he can break the idealization of the scheme when we replace by a free random function. But this argument <coughs> needs some condition to be valid. So this argument is valid if the adversary doesn't have access to the key, the PRF key. Because if he has access to the PRF key, he can easily distinguish the PRF from the random function. And if this PRF key is not used anywhere else, but for distance fraud, if you consider distance fraud, then this first condition is not satisfied. In distance fraud, the adversary is a prover who holds a key. So the adversary knows the key. So this condition is not satisfied. And if you try to protect against terrorist fraud, so that's the case which is here, the key is used somewhere else. It's not only used in this PRF, it used, it's used somewhere else. So this second condition is not satisfied either. So you can not use this argument. Actually, so this, so in some papers, so there, there is a proof of security which is based on this argument, but this proof is incorrect. But it's even worse. It's not only that the proof is incorrect, but the result is also incorrect. So there are some PRF for which the protocol is insecure. So actually, we can construct PRF for which the protocols are insecure. So for the part protocol TDB. Uh, what we do is that we try to program a PRF 
that it will render the protocol insecure. So this is a technique that we proposed uh, recently at the Latin Quick Conference. We say that if we start from a PRF, let's say that G is a PRF, we'll construct another PRF, which is almost everywhere equal to this PRF G, except at some very special points, which are some kind of trapdoor. These trapdoor are not accessible to a uh, regular adversary. So here the idea is that this PRF will have a trapdoor, which is actually the key of the PRF. It says that if the NP that you input here is equal to the key, if the NP is equal to X, you will say that FX of NKB is equal to X concatenated with itself. In other case, it just corresponds to the G. So with this property, we can easily show that F is also a PRF, but when we plug F in the protocol, the protocol is insecure. So why is it insecure? So imagine that now you have this F, and you have, you have a malicious prover. So the malicious prover could select the, his nodes NP equal to his secret X. So he selects NP equal to X. And what will happen is that Fx of NP and V will be equal to X concatenated with itself. So A1 and A2 are equal to X. A1 is equal to X. A2 is equal to X. And the A3, which is A1 XOR, A2 XOR, X, is also equal to X. So no matter what is the challenge, the response will always be a bit of x. So since the response doesn't depend on the challenge, the malicious prover can send the response before he sees the challenge. So he can anticipate the challenge and send the response before, so that the response will arrive on time, and the verifier will think that the prover is close to the verifier. Okay? So we have here a distance fraud based on the weak PRF. So to avoid this kind of attack, uh, we propose to change the business protocol by using the notion of PRF masking here. The idea is that now the verifier will select the vector A. So we will select A1 and A2, and it will send this selection <coughs> encrypted using the PRF. So what we send is N, which is A, so FX of N, P, and B, send it to the prover so that the, verifier, the prover can decrypt and get A. So it's almost the same protocol, except that now the prover has no influence on this vector A1 and A2. So he has no influence, he cannot make A1 and A2 be equal to X, for instance. So even with a regular PRF. So now with a PRF, we can formally prove that it resists <coughs> uh, to a distance fraud. How about uh, terrorist fraud? It's still insecure. So this is still insecure against terrorist fraud. And we can, again, program the PRF so that the protocol is weak against terrorist fraud. So how does it work? We start with a PRF, an existing PRF. And we define a predicate which will say what inputs to the PRF are trapdoors. So we have a, an input, possible input uh, to the PRF. So actually, it's half of the input. So half of the input, some alpha and t, and we define this relation. So this relation will depend on x. And normally, it's hard for, the, for an adversary to create a string alpha and t which satisfies this predicate. So we won't enter into the detail of this predicate. But imagine that this predicate say which string alpha t is a trapdoor and which is not. Now to define this function f, this pair of f, f, uh, you say that for the trapdoor, if you use a trapdoor input, if NB is a trapdoor, if, if NB satisfies this predicate, then you answer by A1 and A2 equal to X. But this is exceptional. In the other cases, you will answer to something which looks like random. Uh, actually, it's not exactly the function G. So the function G will return some alpha, beta, gamma. And what you return is alpha, beta, gamma, and beta XOR GX of alpha. So we can show that this construction is also PRF. Now what can we do with this PRF if we plug it to our protocol? We can have uh, an adversary who plays with a prover and who sends as a challenge 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, and then 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. So for half of the runs, the challenge will be 1. For the other half, it will be 3. So when the challenge is 1, 
the answer is from the vector a1. So the vector a1 is alpha beta. Okay. So for the first half, you will answer with a bit of alpha beta. So the first half of alpha beta is alpha. So you will give to the adversary the vector alpha. Then for the other half, the challenge is 3. When the challenge is 3, you answer with a1, so a2, so x. So a1 is this, a2 is this, so a1 and so a2, so x. That's only the right part. You will answer by gx of alpha, so x. So you answer with gx of alpha, so x, which is like actually uh, what is satisfied this relation. So if you do it like this, the response will form a vector alpha t, which satisfies the predicate. So if you run the protocol with this set of challenge, you learn one trap door. So you can run again the protocol using this trap door. You select nd equal to this trap door, and the prover will select a1 and a2 equal to x. So it means that will give, the prover will give all the bit of x by answering to the challenge. So with this, you have uh, you have uh, another attack, which is the man in the middle attack, against the protocol by programming the peer. And now there is no way to change the protocol. Actually, we didn't find any way to change the protocol to make it secure, uh, so that we can prove that uh, it's secure based on the PRF assumption. So the only way we found to fix this problem is to put some extra assumption to that. Essentially, what we want to do, uh, what we want to do here, so we have this f depending on the key, but we are using the key somewhere else. So if you know the result, of, the results about homomorphic encryption, uh, you know that for doing the bootstrapping technique, at some point you need to encrypt a secret key with a public key. So you need to, uh, you need a crypto system which is secure when you encrypt your secret key yourself. So that's exactly the, the idea that we have here. We have a key, and we will use the key somewhere else. So we, we will need some extra notion. So for uh, homomorphic encryption, it's called a C circular uh, uh, security for the encryption. And here's a, a similar notion that we need, uh, which is notion of circular key security for a PRF. So now we will need some extra assumption to this uh, uh, circular king security. Circular king security means that if you have an oracle such that you can select the input of the PRF and you can select a linear combination of this PRF and a vector x prime, by playing with this oracle you cannot distinguish if x prime is equal to x or if x prime is completely independent from x. Okay. That notion of circular key security. If you cannot distinguish when x prime is equal to x or x prime is independent, in a proof, when you write a proof, you will uh, first you have this x and you will change it to another game where you put something independent from x, and then you will use the PRF assumption to prove the security. Okay? So there is one technical problem here is that if you pick some queries which are all equal for the input of f, and if you have some uh, coefficient b uh, with a linear combination which is zero, you have to enforce that the similar combination of the a is also zero. You have to enforce this combination to be zero. Otherwise, you could make the, the linear combination of these responses and learn some bit of information about x prime and distinguish if x prime is x one. So you have to assume that for your queries. And with this, you have a new notion of security, which is used for API, which is secular king security. Now we may wonder if it is feasible to construct a circular king secure PI. And the answer is yes, because we can easily construct them in the bottom rock alone. Okay. That's the kind of something to check on this. Okay, what I forgot to say is that all the other, there are many other protocols which have problems with PRF programming. These are the protocols that we were able to break uh, using PRF programming. So we were able to instantiate the PRF 
uh, by making this protocol weak, for instance, with the protocol by pure holes initially Casper and Monete, uh, protocol by Hanke uh, and Kuhn, Awan Chakatel, Red et al., and also the Swiss knife protocols that I mentioned before. Okay? So now we have a protocol in which we assume that F is a PRF with a circular key security. There is still something that we didn't uh, consider is the presence of noise. So remember that when you send a challenge, you don't have any time to waste. You need to answer immediately. So you have no time to do computation and you're sending just a single bit with very weak power. So eventually there will be noise. So some rounds will fail. So some rounds will, will be incorrect. So you have to tolerate, to tolerate the noise. So since the probability to have some error in one round will be a constant, the number of rounds uh, which will fail will be linear eventually. So you have a linear number of failure, so you need to tolerate some errors. So what you will require now is that there are at least a number tau of correct rounds in this protocol uh, to make the verifier happy about the proof. So if we do that, we may think that it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have any impact of security, but actually it has. There is uh, something which have been overlooked by many people uh, uh, in this protocol, which have been uh, published very recently. It was in December uh, last year. Uh, it was a problem identified by Henke, which says that, okay, so now if you don't need to pass all the rounds, it means that you can make a very interesting terrorist fraud now. You have this malicious prover, his friend adversary here. What they can do is that they can collaborate for the initialization phase. But at the end of the initialization phase, the malicious prover will compute the response function. So for this protocol, the response function is defined here. And it will send the, the table of this response function for exactly tau rounds. So you give tau response function to the adversary. The adversary will be able to use these tables to respond correctly to tau runs. All the other runs will be answered at random. And it doesn't matter because the verifier only need tau correct runs. With this response function, of course, it will leak some bits of the secret. But it will leak only tau bits of the secret. So if you make sure that you're leaking the tau same bits for every terrorist throw, then you don't reveal all the other n minus tau bits. And since it's a linear number of bits which remains, uh, it, uh, it still uh, it, it requires exponential time to reconstruct the sequence. Okay? So it doesn't lead the secret. It leads one bit, one, one part of the sequence, but not all the bits. And it still takes exponential time to fully recover the secret. So you have here a terrorist fraud. Uh, uh, which, which is based on the tolerance to noise. So now we have a problem to fix this because uh, there is uh, actually no easy way if you, you want to, to have this kind of, uh, of protocol. So now we will uh, move on to a protocol that we designed to resist to all these kind of flaws that we call the SKI protocol. So why the SKI protocol? Uh, you may wonder what is this acronym. So we have found the symmetric key infrastructure as an existing acronym. We have found the Sheffield Kidney Institute. <laughs> we also have found the Serial Killers Inter Authority. So we are looking at this here. Actually, the acronym comes from the uh, name of the author. So I work on this with my friends uh, Katarina and Johanna. And we just get uh, the first letter of the first name to make this uh, happen. So what is this uh, SKI protocol looking like? So it's very similar to what we presented, except that now, instead of soaring to X here in this third possible uh, challenge, we soar to some uh, information about X, which comes from a leakage scheme. So we, we have a leakage scheme, L mu X, which will leak some information about X. So the idea here is that the verifier will choose what is a leakage function 
that uh, he wants to have in the case there is a terrorist fraud. And this n mu of x is defined here. So essentially, this n mu of x will have all the bits of x prime equal, and they are all equal to the dot product between mu, this vector mu, and x. So it means that now, if you try to do a terrorist fraud uh, like before, you will reveal tau bits, and these tau bits will all be equal to mu dot x. So it means that you reveal one bit of information about x, but this bit is chosen by the verifier. So if in one execution you choose one mu, in the other execution you will find that you will select another mu, and after a few trial you will reconstruct x completely. So that's what we have found to fix this protocol. So for the completeness, so if we define uh, a function b like this, so if we assume that every but it's for less, so it's because we want to study the completeness. Uh, if we assume that the probability that one round is incorrect is equal to this P noise uh, constant, then the probability to pass the protocol is equal to this quantity. So if we apply the channel bound, so we just take tau over n less than one minus P noise so with some gap epsilon, and with tau over n not too large, then we are ensured to pass the protocol except with the probability exponential minus 2 epsilon square n to the channel form. So we have to select tau not too large, and if tau is not too large, then we have a completeness of the protocol. That's for completeness. Now we can wonder what are the best attack we can find. So here is the best distance flow that we can find against this protocol. Uh, actually, it's not only the best that we have found, we can also show that it's the best, uh, so this attack has the best probability of success that we can have uh, against this protocol. So in this uh, attack, so the prover, the malicious prover just follows the protocol, it says that here, so he has to send a response before he sees the challenge, so he selects the response by taking one response with the largest pre-made by the response function. So to maximize his chance to be correct, he doesn't know the channel, he just selects the R, the response, which has the largest pre-image uh, by this uh, response function. So we can show that the probability that one round is correct is 3 over 4. So if the probability be correct is 3 over 4, uh, then the probability of success of the entire attack, depending on tau, is this quantity. So we can again apply the channel bound. And now we have to select tau large enough so that the probability of success of this attack is negligible. So now we have to select tau over n larger than 3 over 4 plus sub epsilon. So tau over n needs to be larger than 3 over 4 and need to be less than 1 minus p noise so that we have the two properties. So that's the best distance flow that we have. The best mafia fraud that we have is this one. In this uh, attack, you have the adversary in the middle who just relays the messages, and then he does a protocol with a prover who is far away so that he will learn one response for every one. After he learns one response for every one, then he can start the, uh, the uh, distance bounding phase with a verifier. So if the verifier selects the same challenge as the one that he sent to the prover, then he's happy, he knows how, he knows how to answer. Otherwise, he just answers at random. And with this attack, we can show that one round will be correct with probability 2 over 3, 2 thirds. So we can redo the same computation. And what we deduce is that tau over n needs to be larger than 2 thirds plus some epsilon, so that the probability of success of this attack is negligible. So that's the best part of fraud that we have again the protocol. And the best terrorist fraud that we have is this one. So uh, that's the best probability of success that we, we can have. So you have a malicious prover and the, and the, his friend, the adversary. So they just collaborate for the initialization phase. And at the end of the initialization phase, the malicious prover will send a table of response function, but this table of responses is corrupted. So what he does is that he selects 
set of challenges, and he sent the table except that for this particular challenges, he, he put something which is random. So instead of putting for sure the correct answer, he put something which is random. So sometimes it's the correct answer, sometimes it's not. So he sent this table to the adversary, and the adversary will use it uh, to response. Uh, so it's uh, easy to show that it doesn't reveal the secret because there is one challenge with, which is one, one response in the table which is always random, so it doesn't lead to the secret. But here's the probability to pass a protocol. We can show that it's 5 or 6. If it's 5 or 6, then by applying the channel of bound, we obtain that tau of n must be greater than 5 or 6 plus some epsilon, so that the probability of success is negligible. So to summarize, if T noise is less than 1 over 6, minus epsilon, then we have completeness, we have resistance to distance fraud, resistance to mafia fraud, resistance to terrorist fraud, with a failure probability bounded by some, this exponential. But we need this condition. So if the noise has a probability less than 1 over 6, then we can tune tau uh, correctly uh, so that we, we have a completeness of the resistance to all these uh, uh, forms. Actually, these are not only the best attacks that we found, but we can also prove it. We can prove that uh, these are the best uh, attacks, so uh, we are convinced that our proof is correct. Uh, so if the proof is correct, then we have that if the PR, if we have F is a circular in secure PRF, and we have uh, we need we require tau correct uh, rounds uh, out of n, then there is no distance fault which can succeed with a probability greater than this. There is no mechanism in the attack which can succeed with a probability greater than this. And if you have a collusion fault such as the, the collusion fault succeeds with a probability greater than this for for uh, anybody to see here, then you can use the view of the adversary to run a man in the middle attack which will run, which will succeed with that probability. Okay, and it corresponds to the values that we have here. So it means that if P noise is less than one over six, you can tune tau such that all these probabilities are negligible. Okay, so we that's maybe the first uh, distance bounding protocol for which we can prove the security against all these uh, threat models. Now the question is can we optimize this, uh, uh, this protocol? Can we do something more efficient? Uh, can we minimize uh, N, for instance, corresponding to some security? Can we adjust tau correctly? So what happens if we have a probability of noise which is greater than 1 over 6? Then we don't know how to solve this problem at the moment. So we don't we don't have any protocol which can tolerate the uh, noise with priority greater than one of six. So that's actually the first step to make a uh, secure distance problem. So that's the conclusion. We have seen that there are several protocols uh, which are insecure in the literature, and even some many security proofs which are incorrect. But now we have a protocol for which we can prove the security. And uh, now we wonder if we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for questions and comments. Are there any comments or questions from the floor? Uh, 
Um, I have a question. Um, is uh, the ski protocol or any uh, protocol uh, in, the, in your presentation uh, adopted in the real world RFID uh, systems? Uh, so actually, uh, I, I don't know about existing uh, distance bounding protocols. So I've heard that some uh, some distance bounding protocol is implemented on my fair car. I don't know about it, but I presume that sooner or later we have distance uh, bounding protocols if we work. Uh, it seems uh, the presented protocols are really lightweight in terms of hardware implementation. Is my guess correct? Yes. So here, essentially, we don't have uh, so much to to do in this protocol, what we have to do is some XOR, some evaluation of the PRF, here it's uh, something completely linear. And for the time principle phase, uh, so if we want to compute online, so we just have to read one bit, or to compute XOR between three bits, but I presume that the best way is just to prepare all the response, to store it in the memory, just to read the memory. So it, just have three bits to stop to prepare one more. And how large is that? Is n. So how many times uh, do you do you have to repeat in the distance bound for uh, phase? So n will depend on the security. Mm -hmm. So depend on the problem? security level. Mm -hmm. So it so can be maybe uh, 80 or maybe even less. How long does it take in the distance bounding phase? So I don't know about practical details. Okay. I presume that here, if you're close enough, uh, with the speed of light being very fast, then it can be just 80 iterations. Very fast. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Maybe you said it, but... Uh, uh, not yet. Not yet. But it and will be in the proceedings. Okay. And uh, is it possible to do something... I know it's FSC, but is it possible to do something analog in the public key model? Yes, so actually the Branson Shunt protocol is in the public key model, but it doesn't resist to terrorist fraud. There is also another paper by... Uh, Some people uh, in Logan uh, who have, who have a paper, uh, a protocol based on public key techniques. But there is also the problem with theories, but it doesn't resist the theories. But uh, it's still open to, so to find a protocol based on public key techniques which resist to all the, these threat models. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? So it's time for lunch. So we thank